Well, astronomers discover, have discovered a potential habitable exoplanet and it's actually relatively close by. Joining me now live is astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU, Brad Tucker. Brad, good to see you. So how close yeah. is it exactly? <laughs> Yeah, look, I mean, it's astronomy, so everything's far away, but it's only a mere 31 light years away. Now, um, you know, what that means is it takes light 31 years to reach it, traveling at the speed of light. But really, the key here is there's not many star systems there, and even therefore planets in those stars that close to Earth. Um, this actually makes it the fifth closest planet that is kind of Earth-like to Earth. Uh, and, and this is why we get really excited because, you know, we don't think we're gonna move there anytime soon, but by being closer to Earth, that means our telescopes and facilities can study it in a lot more detail and more importantly, look for signs of life, biosignatures. So by being a planet that is nearly identical in width to Earth, ever so slightly heavier, but in that habitable zone, the zone that liquid water can exist, it means that there is a strong chance that life may or have in the past or now uh, exist on that planet. And with facilities and telescopes coming online, we may be able to spot that. So that's where we get really excited about these close ones. Yes, that never ending search for life elsewhere. Right. Now, the James Webb Telescope, it's been pretty busy. It's always pretty busy of late. It's still finding things. And this time it's found a small asteroid. Yeah, and it was kind of by accident. In fact, uh, in one of the early data that they were taken um, with one of the instruments on James Webb, uh, they actually kind of were off target and pointing at the wrong spot. Um, but in doing so, they happened to target a point of space where a lot of the asteroids in the asteroid belt hang out. Uh, now, there are thousands, millions of asteroids out there, but a lot of them, especially the smaller ones, are uncatalogued. We know a lot of the ones that are kilometers, tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers in size. But the ones that are only one to 200 meters or smaller, we don't, we only know a handful of them. And those are the ones we really want to map because understanding those smaller asteroids, we know that we are missing a lot of them in our solar system. And those are the ones therefore that we actually worry about because those are the ones that can, uh, not, not this one, but others creep up on the earth and hit us. And while an asteroid that's 100 meters wide won't destroy the Earth, if it hit a city, it would do significant damage. So by understanding and studying these smaller asteroids and showing that James Webb can find them, even by accident, uh, there's a lot of good promise in helping to increase that understanding of where those smaller asteroids are in our solar system. Absolutely, and, and credit to James Webb. I tell you what, it's been uh, extremely helpful exactly. uh, in the space world. Now, this one's interesting, Brad, because a ring around a distant dwarf planet is challenging our idea of how moons are formed. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, so, you know, when we think of Pluto, you know, we just think of kind of this thing that got kicked out of the planet by itself, but there's actually lots of dwarf planets out there, and, and one of them in particular, Quar, um, it's really far away compared to Pluto, but now recently they discovered uh, a ring system around it, essentially a bunch of pebbles and rocks forming around it. And what becomes really critical here is it's past the point where we would expect this to exist. So if you get so close to a planet or dwarf planet, the gravity of that object crumbles and breaks it apart. In fact, we think this is gonna to happen to the moons of Mars. Mars has two small moons that are slowly getting closer. And when they do, they'll reach a point where gravity breaks it up. But these are much further out than that point. So they actually should have formed moons where over time bits clump together. So they get heavier, they get more gravity, they pull more, and then therefore they grow into small moons. But clearly this isn't the case. So it's really starting to show that, well, maybe there's a lot more range of materials out there, maybe stuff that doesn't stick together as well, because all of this is really frozen ice. So maybe there's some unique um, types of ice essentially out there around these moon or dwarf planet systems that don't quite follow the normal process of forming moons. So this is really critical for understanding all of those dwarf planets, all of those things like Pluto, how they formed and how their entire systems because Pluto itself has five moons and it raises a lot of questions. Yeah, absolutely. Now, researchers want to create a dust shield in space to fight climate change. How would something like this work? Yeah, this is an idea that was thrown out this week where if you can lessen some of the energy of the sun, the brightness, the idea is, well, therefore, you have a slightly less heat and energy coming to the Earth. 
Therefore, you can reduce some of the temperature and energy on Earth. Now, you wouldn't put this in our own atmosphere. A, it's costly. B, uh, you put too much and get something like what happened to the dinosaurs, block out too much sun, and then we all die. So the idea is, well, the moon, very dusty, very fine dust, uh, not a lot of gravity, so it's very easy to kick off the dust of it. So if there was a way to eject a lot of that dust and rock from the moon and put it into a position fairly far away from the Earth, but so, not so far away that it doesn't block any light from the sun, you could find that right sweet spot of reducing some of the sunlight. Now, there's obviously lots of problems like this, and I don't think we'll ever see it, but it's one of those things where people are trying to wonder how can we apply maybe some engineering solutions to lessen uh, the impact of climate change um, directly on Earth. And again, I don't think we'll see it anytime soon because as soon as you push that dust out, you have to keep it stable. It's like balancing a marble on a soccer ball. <laughs> One slight move ever so small, it's going to move out. The wind can blow it out of, from the sun, can blow it out of the way. So uh, probably unlikely that it would ever work, but people are thinking. I mean, it just sounds overly complex and yeah. not feasible at all, Brad. Yeah, that's the other downside yeah. of it, to be honest. It's, to, if you could do this, there will probably be other easier, more efficient ways of solving the problem. So, uh, yeah, probably not going to see, but, you know, doesn't stop people from thinking, I guess. Absolutely, and good on them for thinking. That's what they're there right. for. Brad Tucker, good to speak with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Take care.